from the Alex Trebek stage at Sony Picture Studios, this is Inside Jeopardy. Wow, wow. I love it. Thank you, Johnny Guitar Gilbert. Uh, <laughs> I love that. I oh, needed that again today. I'm having hard days right now, producer Sarah Foss, mm. and so I need more Johnny Guitar Gilbert in my life. Welcome back to Inside Jeopardy, your exclusive and official podcast destination for all things happening in the world of Jeopardy. I'm Michael Davis, as I've said. I'm joined today by producer Sarah Foss. Hey, Sarah, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing well. You know, we had a big week last week, three days in the studio of regular Jeopardy, lots of good shows under our belt, and some exciting New champions already emerging. Yeah, yeah. Really amazing uh, to be back in there with regular contestants. We're just having a great time. It's like spring is in the air in every single it way. Has. You're wearing your cherry blossom dress. Yes, uh, And uh, spring is in the air. As, as I told you, if I wear pink, I'm going to make spring happen. Very good. That's a very good thing. Another thing that dropped last week was the JIT list, Michael. And the response, people... They can't believe it. I would say shock and awe. I have felt the love of this list of 27 that we have come up with. Some surprises. Yeah, Claire McNear, a journalist of record for Jeopardy, great friend of uh, the pod, tweeted out yesterday uh, after reading the list, yeah, yeah, Jeopardy tournament fatigue. But look who's going to show up for the Jeopardy Invitational Tournament, uh, all in caps. Yes, I think in particular, people have been talking about Brandon Blackwell and Victoria Gross. Not people who were necessarily on the radar as Jeopardy greats, but you have to remember Victoria Gross defeated none other than David Madden, a 19 game champion. We hadn't seen her, you know, back on Jeopardy for several years, but certainly she has made her mark as the queen on the chase. And the same with Brandon Blackwell. You know, he participated in teen tournament Jeopardy, you know, so look how he has come along in the trivia world since then. Really excited to have those. Yes, they two. both have provenance as they would say in the in in the wine world. Yes. And of course, so many others that people are talking about. Chuck Forrest, you know, the Forrest Bounce, one of the OG greats of Jeopardy is coming back. We also have Colby Burnett, Lily Chin, Arthur Chu, Leonard Cooper, Celeste Danucci, the last female to win the Tournament of Champions before Amy Schneider. We have Drew Garve, you know, no one can forget his We Love You Alex moment. Andrew He, of course, is coming back along with Sam Buttrey and Amy Schneider, our Masters 4th, 5th, and 6th place finishers. Ben Ingram, just so many great TOC champions. Matt Jackson, Alex Jacob, another TOC winner. Mackenzie Jones, Sam Cavanaugh, Larissa Kelly, Alan Lynn, David Madden, the one who Victoria Gross defeated, Pam Mueller, Terry O'Shea, Dan Pawson, Jennifer Quayle, Austin Rogers, Monica Tew, Jason Zafranieri. Whew. Wow. I'm so excited. Well, yeah, and everybody listening, you now get to have the same pre jit excitement that we had in Jeopardy production time previously before we made the JIT. We've now produced the JIT, and we know how sensational it is. Um, and we're just excited for all of you to see these legendary players compete against each other on the Alex Trebek stage. And, um, yeah, it, it is strong. Well, one thing we knew is that we wanted to make this field big. We wanted to include as many champions as we could. And that's why we did have that field of 27. Of course, we couldn't include everyone. We did talk about on the pod earlier that we had we had gone pre-2022 Tournament of Champions season. We were looking for those people who hadn't had a chance yet to make it into the Masters Pyramid. And of course, there were folks who we reached out to who weren't available for a number yeah. of different reasons. I want to make sure everyone knows that Brad Rutter, Julia Collins, Roger Craig, and Emma Betcher all did receive invites. And like I said, for a variety of reasons, they weren't able to compete with us in this JIT, but we certainly hope we'll be able to welcome them back at a future one. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, seems like a, a, a remarkable reception uh, to the JIT field, but you just wait until you see the episodes. And it's all coming out in this really special time, Michael, and that is... The Jeopardy 60th Diamond Celebration. Just like a diamond, Michael. Jeopardy is forever. Yes, the release has gone out in the last 24 hours that we are celebrating beyond just Jeopardy yes. for Jeopardy's 60th birthday. We are having an entire year of celebrations. We're going to be celebrating our diamond anniversary, um, 60 years. My quote on the press release, uh, 60 years ago, Merv Griffin and his wife, Julianne, created a quiz show that remains as unique and exciting today as it was in 1964. It is only fitting to honor their creation and the show's enduring legacy with a meaningful celebration that pays tribute to the show's past and to its future 
and we want to invite every fan to celebrate alongside us as this will be Jeopardy's biggest and best year yet. Um, you know, I, as you know, I started my career working for Merv. I am constantly reflecting on this remarkable program that Merv and Julan created. You know, I've said it multiple times on this podcast. When I go back and watch the original pilot episode and I see how close what we do today, it's, it's advanced, it's come along. Sure. But it is so close to the original program that was created. It is a remarkable feat, not just in the world of quiz shows and game shows. It's a remarkable feat in American television. It's a remarkable feat in global television. And that we and you get to enjoy this to, you know, to this day, it's just a, I, I am constantly reflecting on how much we owe them. And we're going to celebrate this diamond celebration all year long. We're going to be visiting various cities across the country. We're going to be launching a bar trivia game that yeah. is so exciting. And we're going to kick off our multi-city tour just after Jeopardy Day, a couple weeks later, on Friday, April 12th. We are going to have our first ever Inside Jeopardy live on tour. Michael and I will be there. We have special guests like host Ken Jennings, upcoming masters Matteo Roach and Madame Modio, Katie Nolan of Celebrity Jeopardy fame will all be there. Austin Rogers is going to be serving up some Jeopardy-themed cocktails for our VIP guests. And we are so excited about this. Ken's going to host an interactive yeah. game. It's happening at the Edge at Hudson Yards, this beautiful facility where you can see the island of Manhattan as far as the eye can see. And we're just going to be celebrating Jeopardy all year long. Yeah, first ever Inside Jeopardy live on tour. That's going to be happening on Friday, April 12th. Tickets on sale at 12 p.m. Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific time on March 27th. We have a limited capacity. This is true. These are going to go very, very fast. So we encourage you, if you're interested, remember those times. That is... 12 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific Time on March 27th. Tickets will be available at www.edgenyc.com forward slash en forward slash jeopardy. You know, when I stood up there on the edge, when I first went to scout the yeah. location, I had this moment because you're right. You can see the whole of Manhattan stretched out. You see across the Hudson River to the East River, all of the bridges up to Central Park, you know, the Bronx, beyond New Jersey, Brooklyn, Staten Island, like you see everything. And I just imagined how many clues <laughs> I walked, I came back in, I was a nightmare for like 48 hours because <laughs> I wanted to develop technology so yes. that we could, we could, you could check your phone and you could see every clue that was ever written that you could see with your own eyes, you know, from Central Park to the, to the, to the, to the Statue of Liberty, to all of the bridges to all of the boroughs and all of the landmarks. Like there must be so much geotagged Jeopardy material that is sitting out there. I was just very inspired by the location. And we're going to get there, Michael. Maybe not by April 12th, but I love that idea. We're going to get there. And Jeopardy was birthed 60 years ago in Manhattan, yes. on Manhattan at the old NBC studios. Um, and that's, that's where it started its life. Seems very fitting to celebrate our 60th birthday in that very important city. If you were watching television yesterday, you caught a profile piece on our very own host, Ken Jennings, featured on CBS Sunday Morning. And this was really fun. It's my favorite television program that is not Jeopardy. <laughs> it's true. And they sent a crew here last week. It was a really quick turnaround for them, but so fun to see them getting to see Ken in action. They also visited him in Seattle. So if you haven't had a chance to watch that piece, find it if you can, because it's a really great look behind the man that is Ken Jennings. And, you know, he's coming up on his 20th anniversary Amazing. of appearing here on Jeopardy. So lots to celebrate for him as well. Yeah. So many other things are going to be announced in the course of the year for this uh, Diamond Celebration. Um, other tour stops, some other things that even you don't know, Sarah Foss, that are going to be announced over the course. I know I have secrets from you even. Wow. Um, of some other things intrigued and that are going to happen this time. year. Um, and so just very excited to, um, to celebrate this remarkable program with all of you. Well, there is lots to look forward to to celebrate. But right now in Jeopardy! airtime, we are in the midst of a very exciting Tournament of Champions final. We've got Yogesh Rout, three-game champion from last season, six-game champion from last season, Troy Meyer, and nine-game champion, Ben Chan. And as we kick off Game 5 today, Ben Chan has already secured two wins, so it could all come to an end today, or we could see this play out until all the way up till Wednesday. 
So as soon as we do crown our champion, our newest Jeopardy master, you can head to our YouTube channel and watch an exclusive interview with that winner. And of course, after all of that, we're going to head straight into the Jeopardy Invitational Tournament. And today on the pod, we mentioned them on the JIT list earlier, Amy, Andrew, and Sam. They're going to join us to talk about how they are preparing to return to the Alex Trebek stage. But before we get to all that, let's head back to season 25 for this week in Jeopardy history. Let's go to Dan Pawson now. Do we have George? We do. Do we have a large wager? 7,000. That gives you 26,200 today. Yesterday you had 22,301. You are now in the lead with 48,501. Larissa, not looking happy. You said, Philip, what is it going to cost you? 15,000. That'll drop you to 6,800. We add that to yesterday's total. That gives you a two-day total of 31,200. And Dan Pawson, congratulations. You are a quarter million dollars richer. You are the Jeopardy champion. Come on out here, Dan. Larissa Kelly is richer by 100,000, and Aaron Schroeder, 50,000. Way to go. What a game. What a final. This is probably the best final we've ever had, ladies and gentlemen. Let's hear it for these three. That's right, it was March 24th, 2009, when nine-game champion Dan Possum became our Tournament of Champions winner after a two-day total point affair against Larissa Kelly. Dan and Larissa will be back for the JIT. But it didn't come easy. Larissa put on a dominant performance and actually held the lead after day one, carrying it into Final Jeopardy on day two, where she was unfortunately incorrect, allowing Dan to become our champion. And like I said, they will be back on the stage in a matter of days. We kicked off the week with our last semi-final match between Luigi de Guzman, Troy Meyer, and Brian Henniger. This was a great battle between Luigi and Troy. Luigi seemed unstoppable, taking a big lead into double jeopardy, but then Troy found the first daily double in double jeopardy, goes all in with 6,800 to take the lead over Luigi. He continued to build on the lead, eventually finding the last daily double to head into final in first place but it was a triple stumper. So Troy, with a savvy wager, was able to secure the win and the last spot in the TOC finals, joining, of course, Ben Chen and Yogesh Rout. Yeah, I mean, Luigi had beaten Javeria to get in here and was almost becoming, as we were watching this, like, well, something of an outside bet to go all the way, had, like, really blown us away with his, his gameplay into this. Uh, and this was a very, very strong game all round. Like we were watching the stats. I remember being there watching the buzzer stats and the, the speed of the game. Well, and our social and digital team has actually reached out to our TOC contestants and said, feel free to go on Reddit and go on to the you know, recaps and talk about your experience. So it's really interesting to hear Luigi and others you know, really give that contestant point of view. So if you haven't checked that out, make sure to do so. But let's take a listen to how our players were feeling after this very important semifinal game. Boy, I love a game like that where everybody's cooking. Congratulations Ooh. to all three of you. Fantastic play. Troy had a pretty big lead heading into final because of those daily doubles, but uh, Luigi actually had 22 correct responses to Troy's 19. So you needed those daily doubles to win, Troy. Yeah, luck is the name of the game in Jeopardy a lot of the times, yeah. and I was just lucky today, lucky today. I mean, Luigi was incredible, and Brian gave a really strong game, and I'm just- Thank you for saying that. <laughs> very, very fortunate, very fortunate to get out of this game. Luigi, you played such a strong game. Thanks, Ken. Uh, like, there were parts of that game where I think Troy and Brian just could not get in at all. Like, you, you seem dialed in on the buzzer. Is that how it felt to you? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's weird. It comes and it goes. And um, when people ask me what it's like up here, I always tell them there's a five-clue stretch in every game where you feel invincible. That's true. And there's a five-clue stretch in every game where you feel like garbage. And most of the rest of the game is, somewhere, is played somewhere in between. <laughs> and, you know, this is, you know, this is no field of slouches, especially Thank Troy. You. you know, I think a lot of people slept on Troy coming into this tournament. I knew coming in that there wasn't anybody who was going to be more prepped and more ready and more focused on the task than Troy. So, you Thank know, you, I was right. And y'all <laughs> don't sleep on this guy. Man. No. Thank Congratulations you. to both of you. Troy, we'll see you in the final. Yep, don't sleep on Troy. <laughs> Sounds like. I don't like, think anyone. Yeah, will. ever. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we started off the finals on Tuesday with Yogesh Rout, Troy Meyer, and Ben Chan. It was a close Jeopardy round between all three players, but once again, Troy found that first daily double in double Jeopardy, went all in with $9,000. 
To take a commanding lead, he then lost 6,000 on the last daily double, but was able to finish the round strong to maintain the lead heading into final. All three players in five digits over 10,000. Both Ben and Yogesh were correct, and Ben comes from behind to notch the first win in the finals. Yeah, it, this was a sort of uh, a, a pretty shocking moment on stage. I think we were all so excited yes. to have the three of them, so excited to, to see what would happen with these giants of the game playing against each other and an unexpected ending. You know, whenever you see that 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 third place to first place jump in final, it's so possible within the game. It's what's written into, as you say all the time, Sarah, it's called Jeopardy. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it can happen. But I think we're all shocked when it happened on stage. Well, and Ben and Yogesh, we mentioned, were both correct, but Yogesh wagered zero. So had he actually wagered enough to cover Ben, he would have won. We caught up with everyone to talk about that wager after the game. Let's see how Ben was feeling after securing a first win. I have to ask about the wager, Yogesh. Zero dollars. That was pretty stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember what your thought process was? Yeah, I wrote down 6,401, and then I, for some reason, crossed it out. It is pretty stressful up here. And, of course, you never know what's going to happen. I mean, that's a very unusual outcome. Ben, you had no problem coming up with the correct response. How are you feeling about the outcome? Are you surprised? Um, yeah, I'm surprised. You know, I had a fun game. I delivered my lines with gusto. <laughs> I don't think it was my strongest game. I, I would like a Patagonia poncho, but then I realized... <laughs> I think it's less like that would be an expensive poncho, you know? Even but, if uh, Patagonia makes a Nano Puff poncho now, we're not going to retroactively I mean, get Nano Puff it. was in that clue, too? It, it's a Yikes. Puff, okay. Afraid. Well, I should but, read these clues. But you came from third place to win the first game, and you're, you're pretty well positioned right now in the finals. Right. It's been a different experience for me um, in the past couple of days. I was uh, used to winning a certain way when I was on originally, and I've gotten fortunate in my last two, two wins, so... I'll take it, right? I don't want you to make any promises, but are we going to see more Ben Chen gusto? In yeah, the seems, like, seems like the thing to do in these circumstances. <laughs> the gusto won it for you before, but you've got two very tough competitors. Yeah. Troy, yeah. you guys are going to be back in game two. Yeah, we're making Ben work for it here in the finals. No runaways so far. <laughs> yeah. Heading into Wednesday for game two of the finals, another tight Jeopardy round, but Yogesh was able to double up and take the lead on the first daily double in double Jeopardy. Troy then went on a tear, dominating the board and finding the last daily double, where he made a massive wager of $21,800 and was correct, skyrocketing his lead and cruising into a runaway win. Ken did point out that that wager, the third highest in history, biggest ever made by anyone, not named James Holtzauer. Yeah, this was amazing. Just looking at these scores at the end of the game, like two scores over over 40,000. Uh, quite uh, remarkable gameplay. Yeah, even Ben Chan went on Reddit to say, looking through J Archive really quick, I think 48,200 total Coriat in this game is higher than any of the games in the previous TOC. We did look and we agree. Yeah. This is impressive. Yes, the facts agree. <laughs> the facts agree. Well, moving on to Thursday for Game 3, Troy responded incorrectly to the first daily double, but manages to work his way back by the end of the round. Ben, though, in the lead. Ben continued to build on that lead in double jeopardy, but Troy was able to close the gap with the help of a $5,600 daily double. Then Yogesh once again caught fire and found the last daily double. He goes all in with 12000 takes the lead, and maintains it heading into final. All three players correct in final, and so it's Yogesh who secures the win, and now we're tied. One win each. Yogesh played so well in the first two games, didn't get a check mark, comes back in this game, and as you said, like he showed that true champion mentality. Late game, double Jeopardy play. That's a winning combination in Jeopardy. Well, and talk about a combination. Let's just talk about the three of them together. In this game, combined Corey at a $50,200. I mean, these are just unbelievable. I think the highest all-time Corey at that Ben actually pointed out was 50800 That's from a game between none other than Ken, Brad, and James. So wow. this is just, we are seeing top-level play here in the TOC Finals. Yeah, elite. Top level play, but they all miss a Taylor Swift clue. So, you oh, know. Oh, I see uh, producer Alexa has prepared this yes, rundown. Okay. Yes, yes. Songs of youth inspired by her bestie, Tay Tay, saying, When somebody tells you they love you at this title age, you're going to believe them. 
Of course, the correct response, what is 15? But that clue, a triple stumper. Let's see how they felt about the game and maybe that clue. I was kind of fanboying out yesterday when I realized that Troy had 54 attempts in that game out of just 57 eligible clues. Here's the news today. Yogesh and Troy both had 54 attempts <laughs> out of 57 clues. Uh, and Ben was not far behind. You three are just shooting out the lights. What a finals. Yogesh, how was that game? Did you have fun? I mean, you know, um, Taylor Swift has too many songs. <laughs> <laughs> That was, I believe, your only miss in the first round, apart from the Daily Double, was the Taylor Swift clue. Yeah, and Troy seems a little worried. Yeah, I think the Swifties <laughs> are going to murder us for that. Like, <laughs> how, how do these you know, know-it-alls miss that, right? We found three people who know 1980s U.S. Yep. Secretary Generals. They know seemingly everything. I they like Taylor know. Swift, too, and like, I just, I don't know, blanked, yeah. You got a friendship bracelet on right now, yours. That didn't help you with the. Uh, it didn't help you with the Taylor Swift clue. So, so if it was a Taylor Swift friendship bracelet, it would have. <laughs> well, all three of you are playing so well. I feel like any game, anything could happen at any moment, and it's a lot of fun to watch. It's all tied up. We're going to do at least two more games. Congratulations, Yogesh. <laughs> we'll see you back tomorrow. And now a quick word from our sponsor. Selling a little or a lot. Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the, did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person point of sale system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Plus, they have the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. What I love about Shopify is how simple they've made it to grow your business. You can manage inventory, track payments, and view real-time insights all in one place. Shopify is there to support your success every step of the way because businesses that grow grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash jeopardy, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash jeopardy now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash jeopardy. Now back to Inside Jeopardy. And we closed out the week with game four of the finals. Yogesh and Troy battled throughout the entire game while Ben steadily followed behind in third place. Troy was able to find the last daily double in double jeopardy and added $14,000, taking a commanding lead into final. But once again, all three players in five digits, well over $10,000. We love to see that. Ben was then the only player to come up with the correct response in final. So with his all-in wager, he shoots right from third place to first place, securing his second win by just $1 over Troy. What a way to end the week. We need a weekend. Yeah, two check marks for him. Two game wins from third place with, you know, correct finals, with fantastic wagers. I guess almost no choice wagers. But, uh, yeah, very, very dramatic way to end the week. Really setting up Monday and maybe Tuesday and maybe Wednesday perfectly. We talk about this great Jeopardy community, but we don't always talk about the people who are watching the show. We learned from Ben Chan that, you know, he received a postcard during his original run from an 89-year-old woman from right in his town of Green Bay who said, you know, they have these watch parties. And so Ben now attends the watch parties every month. He says it's wonderful. I just, I love these kind of stories about our beautiful Jeopardy community. Ken did catch up with our players right before they headed into the weekend. Let's take a listen. Fantastic game, Ben, when it mattered. Yeah, I, you know, toward the end of double, I was looking at the scores, <laughs> trying to calculate I mean, where I needed to be. That's the same number I was aiming for. Right, yeah, <laughs> but we were in that, that funny, way, exactly that yeah. wagering situation. Yeah, so. if your wish is correct, we would have had a $1 lead over Troy and you yeah. two playing yeah. for a tiebreaker, yeah. Yeah. which I don't know if my heart could have <laughs> put up with. Well, Ben, in two of our four games, you've come from third place to snatch a win. And you now have the lead going into game yeah, five. You were one win here. away from winning this whole thing. <laughs> do you like your odds on Monday? What are you thinking about? Uh, I, no, I mean, it's... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think we need a... There's something beyond a buzzsaw for these two guys. I'm good enough at this game that I know I'll be in the mix. But then, you know, my two wins have happened in pretty improbable finals um, for this to happen. But I've been in the mix, right? So... That's where you got to yeah, be. You gotta we'll be see the if the improbabilities continue. Yeah. But it's been an extraordinary series, and... Uh, Best of luck to all three of you on Monday. 
Well, that wraps up our game highlights. Now on to this week's host chat. An audience member asked Ken, if you were on the show for the first time today, would you play the game differently? Absolutely. Yeah. Like when I was on in 2004, Jeopardy had not yet been professionalized by geniuses like this. We typically took the clues in order. If we happened to found a daily double, find a daily double, we were like, oh, what a, what a nice little mitzvah. Or even, ooh, these are the scary parts of the show. And we would bet a sensible amount, you know. Because who, who in America would bet more than, say, $1,800 on an unseen trivia question, you know? Like we, uh, and now, of course, that's not the game, how the game is played because that's not the optimal way to play at or win Jeopardy. You need to look for those daily doubles. Maybe you want to suck up some money first and then try to find one. You know, you got to strike while the iron's hot because that's how the game is played. And I think every time I've played against somebody doing that, I've had to adjust. But boy, I am not comfortable doing it. You, you saw that in GOAT. Like I had to play James Holtzauer's way and I almost had a coronary. Well, we know three people who have learned to play their game at an excellent level. It's time to welcome to the pod, Michael. Let's welcome them. Amy Schneider, Andrew He, and Sam Buttry. Hello. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> so good to see the three of you. I have to say, in the world of Jeopardy! Invitational Tournament, I think not that we wanted you guys to not finish in the top three of Masters, but knowing that we had a guaranteed opportunity to see the three of you again <laughs> on the JIT list and in JIT was a welcome thing to both Michael and myself. What was it like for the three of you to know that even though Masters maybe didn't end the way you wanted it to, you were coming back to the Alex Trebek stage. Amy, I'll start with you. Yeah, and I think I might have commented on this elsewhere, but like in the aftermath of not qualifying for the the semifinals of the Masters, I had this like, you know, day of being like, is this just the end for me? Have I like, have I reached my peak? Do I even want to do this anymore? <laughs> um, and then I was in the audience for the semifinals and 60 seconds into watching the first game, I was like, oh yeah, I want to be back up there. And so like from then on, it's been a relief to know that I'm going to get a chance to be back up on the Alex Trebek stage and get a chance to sort of defend my honor and like do a better job and not not end on the note that I had ended on. How about for you, Andrew? I think I had a similar experience to Amy. Uh, you know, you kind of get the post-Masters blues, I would say, <laughs> um, where, you know, you're a little, you're, you're, you're kind of questioning everything that you could have done uh, a little bit, just a little bit, tiny bit better on that stage. Then you just kind of reflect, you know, we would have been told that, I think you actually told me on this podcast that uh, <laughs> I would be returning for, for another tournament. That was definitely welcome news. And uh, it just reminded me how lucky I am to be uh, in the conversation, you know, uh, to, to come back and play this game because it, it became just this uh, exercise of gratitude for me, actually. Or I thought about, you know, maybe I didn't perform to, you know, the absolute best to, to stick it in masters, but I get to come back and be with another very celebrated group of uh, contestants. How about for you, Sam? Yeah, I think those guys have said it pretty well. I was very disappointed with the way I'd done in Masters, but I recognize that, uh, you know, I was up against some of the best Jeopardy players or have ever been. And um, so then I was confronted with a bit of a choice. Do I want to double down, learn all the facts that there are, and, uh, you know, hold out hope? Because I don't know that I knew I was going to be invited back for JIT, um, <clears throat> but I was certainly hoping it. But on the other hand, you know, there's part of you that says, look, I've accomplished what I need to accomplish in Jeopardy. Maybe instead of memorizing the capitals of Africa, I should be out enjoying life. So uh, when <laughs> when it became clear that I was invited, you know, you, the competitive juices kick in and it was uh, time to prepare. But, uh, you know, I, I'm just glad to be back here with uh, an opportunity to redeem myself for what I thought was a uh, uh, a performance in the Masters that didn't go the way I wanted. I just want to jump in and say that this is literally true, that I have spent time two day working on the Capitals. <laughs> so. That's so good. What's so amazing, Amy, when you came down and attended uh, Jeopardy Honors and you came to uh, some of those tape days for TOC, I remember you said to me at some point, I go, I said to you, what's it like, you know, being back on the Alex Trebek stage and watching this whole thing. And you said, put me back in, coach. <laughs> was that moment <laughs> that you had that moment that you really yeah. sort of felt it hard. And mm. Amy, we know, you know, when you were going through Masters, you had a lot going on. Your book was coming out. You know, life was very busy. Do mm -hmm. you feel like you've had time to kind of settle back? I remember at one point you said, maybe I'll take a vacation. I haven't done that in two years. Have you found that there was time <laughs> to live life and also you know, get back to the flashcards or whatever your mode of learning is. 
Yeah, no, there definitely has been, you know, like my book came out, I went on the tour and it was a great time and everything. And then I had kind of a winter of like downtime, which was the first downtime I'd had in about two years. Um, and so then like, you know, I'd known I was going to be in JIT, but once I got the uh, the notification and that was there was an actual date for it, then I was like, okay, time to to get back into get back into training and have my Rocky montage, and so it's it's been kind of fun getting <laughs> back in that mode. And meanwhile, Andrew at home, taking care of the Jepper baby, the original <laughs> Jepper baby, the original Jepper yes, baby. There have been more. I, I know there since. are some that will, that that are coming after him, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. The original, the OG. Uh, the OB, the OJB, I think, I guess okay, is what it is. Yeah, the OJB. So, uh, and you said to me when I saw you, this is pretty much the first time you'd left, not the house. I'm sure you'd left the house at some point, but the first time you'd <laughs> left and and left the Jeppa baby at home overnight to go and be anywhere else. Yeah, I think it's the longest, uh, the longest I had gone. Well, and we know when you come back for JIT, uh, you will be identified a little differently. You're now a stay-at-home dad. Tell us yeah. about that career change. Well, you know. I, some people may know that uh, Jeopardy has been very good to me. You know, I've <laughs> made, made a good amount of of money playing a game. Um, and one of the benefits of that is I, I get to basically be a full-time dad, watch my kid go through all of his milestones, like basically 24-7. Um, and that's something that's very special to me. And it, it is also very challenging, though, I, I would yeah. have to say. Uh, <laughs> But I'm glad I have a pile of Jeopardy money to, you know, <laughs> to sleep on after the exhausting, uh, you know, after an exhausting day. <laughs> well, in the last week, the Jeopardy community has learned the field of 27 for the Jeopardy Invitational Tournament. They knew about the three of you. But what's it like for the three of you to hear about those other 24 people, you know, Jeopardy legends, different phases of the show that you will now have the chance to compete against? Uh, terrifying, I think. Um you know, because I also like I understood that there were going to be Jeopardy legends, but didn't really understand how much there would be like just trivia world sure. legends um, like, you know, Brandon and, and Victoria and, uh, you know, some other people in, in that class. It, it went beyond even just the people I was afraid <laughs> of facing and some people I hadn't even thought to be afraid of that are, that, that are going to be yeah. there. Uh, Claire McNear, the great journalist of record. Uh, of Jeopardy texted me yesterday freaking out about the the the, the jit field when it was announced uh, for very much the same reasons Amy and Sam I know you had told us months ago you were really hoping to meet and play with Colby I know that was one of the folks you were hoping was on the list yeah very much I have a, a number of Jeopardy heroes besides Andrew and Amy uh, that include <laughs> uh, Colby and also I was very delighted to see Drew Gar the former uh, college champion who just seems like a, a hilarious guy. But uh, I'm, I'm with Amy. There was some uh, talk earlier from some non-Jeopardy person about how the tournament was going to be laid out, which I foolishly believed, which was that the three of us, <laughs> Andrew and Amy and I, were going to get seated into the semifinal <laughs> somehow magically. And I thought, well, shoot. Uh, you know. You're too online, Sam. Yeah, I know. Too online. <laughs> so uh, then it became revealed that it was single elimination, and I could not think of two people out of those 27 that I wanted to face in Jeopardy. Because uh, yeah. I've seen them all play, I, I think literally all of them, including Chuck, including Celeste, folks from back <laughs> in the day. And uh, I guess I was just uh, hoping, <laughs> hoping to have fun and hang out. There are a few of them that I've met before, Jason, Sam Cavanaugh who are just really great people. So the opportunity to hang out with them is great, but the opportunity to be crushed under their boot heel is not something I had been looking forward to. I mean, it does occur to me, um, to extend the sports analogy, that Jeopardy as a sport is quite unique because we can play our champions and our greats against each other across eras. It's those arguments that take place all the time, right? In basketball is, is you know, Larry Bird Celtics, how would they do against, like, you know, Allen Ivinson's 76ers how would that do against like the you know your beloved warriors today amy it's like but we get to actually see that mm -hmm. in jeopardy yeah and i think that's uh again and i feel like this is a point i made before but that is again a tribute to the writers because it is the case that the writing has been a consistent level of difficulty for decades and so you know unlike in basketball people were playing literally a different mm -hmm. game of basketball you know, 30 years ago. But Jeopardy has been the same game this whole time because it has just been pitched at the, at the same level consistently for so long. Yeah. Andrew, how about for you? What was the, the, the reveal of the field? How did that feel to you? The reveal of the field? Um, I can tell you exactly how I felt because um, <laughs> I think Sam and Amy will know that 
I'm usually the last one to come out of the elevators and get to the bus. Um, so everyone's always <laughs> waiting for me. And I get on the bus day one, you know, and I think the first person I see is Brandon Blackwell. And and in that moment, I'm like, oh, no, what's going on here? <laughs> and then I see Jason Zuffernary and just all these all, all these people. Y- you kind of imagine what the what the field is going to look like coming in. And there was a considerable amount of overlap with who I thought was going to be there. But there were still enough like great surprises that, you know, it made it a very, very, very fun bus ride that, that very first day. Did you feel any pressure having, you know, earned your spots, but almost by default coming into the JIT? Did you feel any sense of, yes, we absolutely belong here or, wow, I kind of feel like we have to prove ourselves because there are so many legends in this group? Yeah, no, that's exactly how I felt. (laughs) I thought, you know, I've had uh, better luck than anybody in the history of Jeopardy, I think. Just out of nowhere, I got into the professor's tournament, squeaked through it, managed to get passed into the TOC finals, which I didn't win, went to the Masters, I didn't win. I feel like I was um, in the JIT partly because of recency rather than of my career achievement. So I really felt that I needed to uh, prove something here, win a game or do something or beat somebody really good. So we'll have to see what happens. But I really felt there was uh, uh, pressure on me to show that I belonged in this group of great champions. Can I just say, though, I just want to correct (laughs) the record right there. Even if you lacked your magnetic charm and sparkling personality, Sam, just statistically you would still be there for me. So I'm not, I don't want you to get a personality lobotomy. I like your sparkling personality. I like all of that, but statistically you very much are part of that world. And is there like an implantation procedure also where I can get, you know, you, you can get it. do that, I can get You can take bit. it. It would be Sam and Andrew. My word, that's a high concept movie. I'll pitch that to Tom Rothman. I love that. Thank you. That's nice of you to say. And I'm just uh, here for Andrew's anecdotes anytime he needs me. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's not that I didn't feel that I had earned my way into it because, you know, I, I've been very successful and, and, and all of that sort of thing. Um, but I, I do feel a lot of pressure to come in and, and at least win a game. Cause I, you know, I was like, Oh, for six, the last time I was on that stage. With many and, a second place finish you know, though, Amy, so many won points. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. And is, you know, going back and look at it, looking at it, I'm seeing how the margins were close the whole way through and I had some bad breaks and all of that. But nonetheless, there is this feeling of, I don't want to be over seven, <laughs> you know, basically. I think someone with, you know, a little less self doubt, probably wouldn't say something like this, but normally on the stage, I don't have it in the back of my head that if I say something wrong or if I answer something incorrectly, that I'm going to feel too much shame about it. But I think if you, if you know that these people are watching and you know that any question that you miss, um, it's going to be a no brainer for, for three quarters or, you know, 80% of the people, people there. I think that, that, that does kind of, it, for me, at least it, it definitely popped into my head where I'm like, you know, sometimes you, get, you have to take a swing and you're going to fall flat on your face. It's going to be really fun for them to be kibitzing about how, how terrible of an answer you just gave, uh, because the level of knowledge there is just so high. But the flip side of that is you have all graduated from playing regular Virginia Jeopardy. You know, you'll never play against two newcomers unless I create something new or unless you allow me to create something new um, you will you'll never play regular Virginia Jeopardy again you're only ever going to play elite level Jeopardy against elite level competition and Amy you and I have had some conversations about this it is a different game when you're playing elite level Jeopardy I mean yeah for sure and it is oh believe me I have had that thought that never again will I get to go up against two like starry eyed you know <laughs> rookies and, and all of that sort of thing um but i also just want to on what andrew said because I, you know i know that thought process and i i i do think the same way but what i keep reminding myself is that's a myth we think that every time we don't know an answer everybody else does like that's just how we are and how we think but it is not true Andrew, there are definitely times playing against you when you have been the only one of the three people on stage that knew the answer. That has not been like an uncommon thing. I mean, it's just the, it it is hard to bust the myth, right? I would say that, you know, uh, Matt Jackson definitely knows all the answers. So, (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, now that you've been to Masters before and knowing, although we had a lot of, you know, different things that happened in our first ever recording of Masters, it maybe didn't go exactly as we had planned, but it certainly was a great time had by all, you know, the three of you came back for the finals to cheer on your competitors. Knowing what Masters is and what an opportunity it is to just be with, you know, five other Jeopardy greats, is the motivation even greater to get back there? Or is it just really about another chance to play this game for JIT? I mean, I think I'm I'm really motivated to get back, uh, in part just to like you know see Matea again, because <laughs> uh, I know they're not they're not coming down for the the taping of the the jet. But that said, I look at this field and I'm like, only one of the 27 of us is going to Masters, and it, it just seems crazy that 26 of this group of people are are not going to win and not going to 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 qualify for it. So. You know, I sort of hope to, but like that is too much to think about right now. I've got to just think about game one. JIT may just be a harder competition than Masters. You know, I think you could definitely have oh, that definitely. argument. I've definitely pitched that. You know, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I think the other 24 people in the room, they hadn't gone through that. Some people agreed and some people were like, well, how, how could that be? But I think what makes JIT difficult is that you can't have any slip ups. You know, you can't have the one bad buzzer game really you can't have a lot of mistakes because there's just no margin to have one bad game I, I agree with that but also i've been telling myself that's how all of our original run was most of jeopardy is single elimination mm -hmm. and so what i've been telling myself is maybe the sort of safety blanket of masters where if you lose one game you, you still get to play more maybe that was like you know, taking some of my edge off, huh. maybe like being back in this mode is actually going to be better for me. That's so interesting. we'll see. What do you think, Sam? I think my motivation um, to get back to Masters is partly because I, I, I just want to win this thing. Uh, the fact of going back to Masters would be a great bonus. And that was Masters was a delight. I would do that forever if I could. So, yeah, to <laughs> hang out with James and Matt and Matea, as well as these guys and whoever else they throw in there in that environment of getting to play a bunch of games over and over with uh, you know well-written questions, that's a lot of fun. But uh, but I don't think that's my motivation for wanting to win this one. I just want to win this one so I can win this one. You know, <laughs> uh, but I'll settle for getting past the first round, man. A lot of really good players are just going to fall, and I just don't want that to be me. Well, we've certainly seen that in the tournament of champions. You know, with many of our favorites mm -hmm. going in. But I I keep saying, you know, we don't call it Jeopardy for nothing. You yeah. got to play to move on <laughs> and. Yes, you might run it back a different time and have it go a different way, but this is Jeopardy. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you so much, guys. I think I hear uh, the OG Jeopardy baby <laughs> in the background, you know, demanding, oh, <laughs> demanding your, demanding your, your, your attention, and or maybe it's had something time. to chime in and 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 talk about <laughs> it and say. Um, can't wait for everybody to see your performances in the JIT. Uh, just as a, you know, there's no spoiler here. The gameplay and the level of competition in JIT is just remarkable. It's so gratifying for me, and thank you to you on behalf of all the contestants, is just to have these ideas that I walk in one day and I say to Sarah, how about we do the JIT, the Jeopardy Invitational Tournament? She says, the JIT. I go, yes. yes. And we, we have these ideas, quit. and then we... and I. Can I we, bring 27? Sure. Yes, and we think about the pyramid and we think about the ideas and just to be able to have an idea and now we're talking about it having actually been realized and thank you for helping us realize this and being so much a part of our world. I am in awe of your ability and one of the things that's so gratifying to me is to have got to know all of you better and to watch all of you develop not only as Jeopardy players but also as primetime personalities and also just your friendships and your relationships with each other the fraternity the sorority amongst our jeopardy players has been something so special that the three of you really epitomize in every single way so a huge thank you from me to you we couldn't pick better ambassadors yeah i mean i i'm sure i speak for all of us that like apart from playing the game getting to hang out with these two specifically, but with the Jeopardy community in general, it is just, it is always a fun time. It is surprising that a group of people that are not selected for being good people, but just for being <laughs> good at trivia, but they're consistently great people. And it is always, I'm always happy to be around Jeopardy people. 
And that is it for today's show. We will be back on Monday to discuss the remaining final games. We're going to see if Ben Chan can lock it up today or if we're going to be heading into a game six or a game seven. And don't forget to head over to our YouTube channel as soon as we crown our new TOC champion for a special Inside Jeopardy video interview. You won't want to miss it. We will see you all next week. See you then. For more great Jeopardy videos, hit the subscribe button below.